What I've been um, doing, I guess, essentially, uh, beginning last time, and what I'd like to go on with, uh, is not really only a discussion of ideology, uh, which we'll get to again in a, in a moment, but in a sense, a kind of restructuration of this, uh, of the of the things we've been doing in this course. Um, uh, I think I said I would do this at the beginning, namely that after we'd gotten through many of these post-structural materials, and uh, that was primarily Foucault and, and Derrida at that point, we might want to go back and change the entire framework in which we were looking at those and look at them uh, in a quite different and maybe larger and more historical uh, framework. Um, uh, and uh, and therefore, I think, uh, although it might have seemed it might have seemed more desirable to begin with uh, with this uh, and to um, uh, and to organize the thing as a whole in terms of ideology, I think uh, there was a certain uh, desirability in um, finding ourselves forced to um, to confront this this topic and this new framework which is, therefore, uh, in a way for us, a new beginning. Um, and since it involves a great many different things, a uh, uh, number of different, uh, different writers and thinkers, Nietzsche, for example, whom we will finally talk a little bit about today, a uh, number of different themes, this may strike you as a kind of chaotic uh, thing to do. Um, but hopefully it'll, it'll uh, simplify itself as, as we go along. Now, uh, I think the first thing was, so I'm going to start, in a sense, all over again um, uh, about the, the matter of ideology. Now, as it not in terms of the history of ideological analysis, but uh, as it uh, concerns uh, us, I mean, that's a kind of fictive uh, us, uh, who are presumably many of us, most of us, some of us, um, interested in uh, literary texts or cultural texts, and who may therefore be expected to have to make somewhat different demands on this question and problem of ideology than would, let's say, uh, philosophers, social scientists, uh, uh, and so forth. That is to say, um, we have a twofold problem. Uh, when you're in the world of, um, just in a very loose kind of way, of social science or political science or something, uh, Ideological analysis uh, is um, a matter of determining what, what ideology, what the nature of ideology is and so forth, uh, uh, how it functions uh, 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 and so on. Now, uh, when we come to it, um, we have to not only know all about that, that is what, how ideas are or become ideological, how a system functions ideologically, but then on top of that, we have a second problem, which is to say, even if a given set of ideas is an ideology or is ideological or something, how does it get into uh, a literary or an aesthetic text? Uh, and does that not somehow change the status of these, uh, these ideas uh, or, or these ideologies? Uh, or at least uh, does it not require us to invent or devise some second stage, second degree way of um, of uh, deciphering the ideological charge or investment that a, uh, that a literary text can have. So, um, so in a way, we have to do really more than the conventional, if there is one, the traditional theory of ideology. We have to make some link between the social science notion of ideology uh, and um, the, the, the problems of, let's say, the symbolic or of the text, that is the question of how uh, even granting that we know what ideology is, which is far from certain, you know, uh, even granting that, uh, we have the second problem of how ideology could get into a literary text. Uh, and there are lots of marvelous uh, sort of period words that we have for that. Now, how ideology gets inscribed in a literary text, if you like that expression, and, and, uh, or invested. I mean, they're different depending on your your, um, your favorite vocabulary field. There are a number of words for this, none of which solves the problem, of course, because these are all figures. Uh, okay, now, um, uh, so, uh, so it is a two-stage process. Now, I would say that for us, um, uh, 
maybe we can think of um, the various <coughs> uh, ways of tracking down ideology in a text on a kind of general sliding scale. Uh, let me not say text anymore, let me say narrative, because essentially uh, I'm, I'm essentially narrative oriented and I consider that even uh, lyrics are narratives in some way and so on and so forth. And, and I think if we talk about ideology and narrative, we sharpen the problem and make it more uh, difficult for ourselves and more interesting because uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's very easy to see how some opinion expressed by somebody or other in a novel is ideological. When Balzac uh, uh, t talks up his uh, royalism and tells us that uh, among th all the various things that are the matter with uh, Restoration France, uh, the worst is the getting rid of primogeniture and, and things like that, we can pretty easily, or when John O'Hara, uh, take a very different kind of realist, uh, uh, gives us long uh, kind of uh, speeches about, um, uh, which express a kind of uh, extreme right Republican point of view about the, the, the problem with the, the, that, uh, that uh, taxes are destroying uh, the, the spirit of free enterprise and so on. Those things, those opinions, we can deal with because it's very easy to, to, uh, to isolate them and to see that they're ideological and that we have to do something. In fact, insofar as we recognize them, we generally don't have very complicated mental operations to perform. We, we identify them at once and, uh, and, and label them and so on. Now, when you're talking about events, it's quite different. That is, when a character does one kind of thing, um, uh, it becomes a little harder to, to fit ideology in. Here, too, there are transitional stages. That is, where you have a setup in a narrative in which you have a hero and a villain, uh, and we find out that the heroes are, um, are policemen, and villains are, let's say, um, misfits, uh, black people, marginals, and so on and so on. Well. Uh, it's not too hard to see that behind this ostensible plot, there is a whole set of opinions about social order being expressed, uh, which are, uh, which look like a narrative, but which are still virtually uh, in the f in in opinion or um, or idea form. Uh, but then uh, then it gets harder. See, suppose you have a work which doesn't have a villain. Now remember, this was sort of our reading of Conrad. That is, uh, we we we. We tried to find the place at which Conrad's text reformed itself into a kind of melodrama in which the hero had um, not one but two alternative kinds of villains. And each of these then uh, was the clue to a certain, uh, to the operation of a certain ideology in Conrad. The first one was the idea of nature as, uh, as this, uh, this force which implacable force which destroys human life. Well, by a little extrapolation, which may have been abusive on the base of that text, but which I think is more generally justified if you look at other works of Conrad, um, it would seem clear that this is then the existential, uh, the already forming here is a kind of proto-existentialism in which uh, um, uh, God is the, the first uh, criminal because he made human beings mortal in which uh, uh, nature is, uh, is this absurd, which is destroying human life, and so on. And insofar as that's a metaphysic, uh, it seems to me that uh, whatever its other values, and however one would want to historically analyze it, uh, it is an ideology, and we, can, uh, and, and we were able to track it as such because we found that this was, in the early part of the work, Jim's enemy. That is, this is the other character, uh, the, the, the villain, so to speak, in terms of which the first part of the plot was articulated and where one has uh, this figure of a villain, where one has the whole action couched in terms of good and evil, or, or generally uh, the evil category or component uh, will reveal the nature of, of, the, uh, of the ideology of work. Now in the second part of the work, as we saw the villain, the content was rather different. Uh, the villain was uh, Gentleman Brown was pretty clearly a sample of uh, this whole late 19th century idea of ressentiment, uh, and this then uh, uh, testified to the, the operation uh, in that part of Conrad of another extremely influential uh, uh, ideology, which is a whole picture of society and history and so on. And, and, uh, 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 and, and so this presence of melodrama allowed us to um, uh, to uh, detect uh, uh, ideology uh, at work. But of course, uh, 
uh, seems to me works are not only rarely, um, rarely melodramatic, but in general, melodrama and the ethical are signs that, uh, uh, that, that the work has already entered a kind of process of ideological self-defense and so on. And so uh, those are not the most difficult uh, or the most interesting uh, problems either. While I'm doing this, let me give you a few other uh, random ways in which uh, this is not a, this is not a, um, I can find this. This is not by no means a, um, an exclusive, a, a, an inclusive list, but it just will give you a few other uh, uh, hints as to how one can, um, ways by which one can uh, move from the analysis of, um, uh, the analysis of narrative uh, or the reading of a narrative to the de detection of its ideological uh, um, components. Uh, I think uh, melodrama would be maybe a special form, that's the nature of the villain, the nature of evil, would be a special form of something more general that maybe you could call typification. And there, if one has a certain kind of type system at work, uh, if, if one can show that the work is really um, flexes a certain kind of typological system in characters or something else, then you've touched a kind of um, mid-layer of the work which, uh, which will be somehow uh, I ideological. Uh, we'll come back to that when we talk a little bit about these Kaimas models that I've been using and, and, uh, and the way in which they can be helpful in, in forms of ideological analysis. But essentially, this is something like, for us today, uh, or in advanced cultures or capitalist cultures, if you like, something like what Lévi-Strauss describes as pensée sauvage, that is, it's a non, uh, not, not unconscious, but not conscious either, uh, um, set of systems that we carry around or that are embedded in our language and that are constantly uh, in operation and that certain works um, uh, uh, organize themselves around. Now, such a system was the value system that I showed in Conrad. Uh, one can, uh, was the, uh, the, the character system that I showed in the Stromo. That is to say, this antithesis between national uh, Liber people's li popular liberation of the 1848 type, Garibaldi, and, uh, and capitalism in its, uh, its reforming, civilizing mission. Uh, this, it seems to me that this opposition uh, is clearly uh, a, uh, a, a pre-conscious uh, ideological op op opposition, which characterizes the way the 19th century thought about itself, uh, has a whole set of functions, and so on, and then, uh, and then is itself articulated to give a certain surface form to the work. These are not, I think, maybe the, the deepest layers of the work, but at least uh, they're uh, non-surface layers that we have to work our way back to, uh, but that when we have found them, reached that, that depth, we are certainly in the presence of some kind of ideological patterning system. Now again, if you don't like the word ideology, uh, uh, you can simply say, well, these are the value systems or something of the period. But I think for reasons I want to say in a, in a while, I think that's not really an adequate way of talking about it. So typification would be another way of, of doing this. Then I think um, the nature of the causality uh, uh, at, that's at work in a given narrative or, uh, and also the nature of the resolutions that are provided in a given narrative or the failure to resolve, uh, the way in which Conrad has to uh, have these uh, dramatic uh, um, Oedipal murders uh, at the end of his books, which are cl clearly don't end anything in a, in a concrete sense, but, uh, but uh, then, then can, by their very uh, unsatisfying quality, can serve as a kind of hint uh, of, uh, of the presence of ideology. Those are, uh, it seems to me, other basic, uh, other basic um, uh, ways in which ideology operates in a narrative. That is, in, in the first case, the notion of causality. Do I have a good example of you for, for that? Well, you know, one could redo what I said about Gentleman Brown in those terms. That is, uh, in the, the, the second part of the plot of Lord Jim, um, uses causality to perpetuate a certain notion of motivation, namely that there are noble souls, Jim was one of us, and then there are all these other ones who are uh, imbued by ressentiment, and uh, ressentiment becomes a kind of uh, picture of human nature, uh, uh, projects a picture of human nature, and thus of human society. 
Now, uh, that's certainly an ideology about human nature, and in the case of ressentiment, we can very, uh, we can very easily um, nail it down to that period, show who worked on, tinkered with this ideology, who brought it into being, uh, what point it serves, and, and so on and so forth. But that would be an example then of how uh, a, the, the, how the, the, the reading of narrative, which um, wants us to get into the story and see it from the inside and so on and so on, is programming us to a certain view of human nature by the way in which uh, this uh, very, by the way in which causality functions. Because in order to read the story, we have to believe that that's why people do what they do. Because that's why Con Conrad has set it up that his characters do what they do uh, because of, uh, uh, for, the, for these reasons. Well then, by the end of this, clearly we have been uh, at least partially programmed to a certain whole view of human nature and how it functions. And this is then an ideological, um, uh, an ideological effect. Uh, then I think um, there are some other things. I think ultimately, and we're, we're going to be coming back to all these things uh, uh, shortly in a, in a different framework, but uh, there would be um, something that I call a kind of presuppositional logic, uh, which is at work in, in plots, that is again, um, uh, in which, this is a way maybe in which, um, uh, in which, uh, one can link psychoanalytic data, unconscious fantasies, to social and, and, uh, and historical and ideological materials. In this sense, it seems to me that uh, what the reasons for Balzac's um, uh, ideology, uh, this ideology of primogeniture, the, uh, the strong family, uh, the way in which it's a kind of, it's a real kind of a Tory conservatism. I mean, Balzac wanted to um, wanted to uh, uh, restructure the country in such a way that the family would be preserved and property would be passed on only to the oldest son and thus large estates could be preserved, a kind of sense of a squire's relationship to the countryside would then redevelop in France. Meanwhile, these people, these local notables, squires and so forth, would then make up the assembly uh, very much in the sense of the British period of the period and so on. Uh, well, clearly all of this is, is, um, is what we call Balzac's conservatism, and it's a, it's a work in a lot of ways in, in these things. But uh, in another sense, uh, we can see that as being related to, to private fantasies on Balzac's part. Uh, we can tie it back to childhood things and family situation and so on, and his situation as a second son and all those things. And, uh, or, or as the, was he the second son, at least as, a, as an un, unloved other son. Uh, and, uh, and we can understand a little bit how a fantasy comes into being, kind of utopian private fantasy, which then needs all of these political presuppositions in order to satisfy itself or to be thought. So then what the novels do is uh, uh, they don't directly imagine utopia, they are not wish fulfillments in that sense. They're not, um, uh, they're not mere uh, projections of Balzac's wishes. Rather, they try to articulate a situation in which uh, these presuppositions about the social order become evident. So it's as though Balzac were trying to, uh, how can I say, trying to program his readership to a conviction about the necessity of all of these various presuppositions which will make his own private fantasy possible. That, that may be a very complicated model, but I think that these are very extremely complicated uh, choices and positions, uh, and, uh, and nothing short of those complications um, uh, can, can do. Well, those are some of the ways, um, those are a few of the ways in which one can imagine, in, in, in which one would have to work uh, in order to try to do something to, um, uh, to, to invent um, a set of methods or categories that were apt to deal with this matter of how ideology gets inscribed in a narrative. Uh, now, clearly, at that point, um, we see that um, uh, one of the other features of, of this history of ideological analysis I, I mentioned the other day, uh, once one begins to historicize this, you see that it becomes essential uh, to, uh, to posit the, the difference, the different status of ideology in different social forms. 
Uh, and at that point, uh, we have an even greater problem, namely that we're talking about narrative, but obviously we mean we're going to have to change our method with, every, with, with narratives of, of uh, qualitatively different types. That is, it, it, would be, be, uh, it becomes obvious that uh, the, narrat the narrative of, uh, of an oral myth uh, of the kind that Levi-Strauss analyzes, and those are virtually ideological analyses, what, what Levi-Strauss performs, and indeed uh, the, the um, the, the structure of myth, the, the little essay in, in um, structural anthropology is, to my mind, one of the two or three great models of, of, uh, of ideological analysis, and it deals with, uh, with uh, the narrative as a way of resolving contradictions and gives us one of the first uh, really um, concrete uh, um, demonstrations of how one can, one can imagine such a thing, how a narrative solves contradictions, not just how the ideas in a narrative might serve to, to repress contradictions or something. Well, um, uh, it's, it's clear that the way uh, that happens in the uh, oral literature of a, of a primitive tribe is going to be quite different from uh, whatever would take the form of ideology in, a, in, let's say, the great oriental despotisms or something, uh, what would take the, 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 the form of ideology in the 19th century uh, in 19th century classical capitalism, and what would take the form of ideology today or, uh, or in future societies. Uh, uh, Adorno has a very important reflection that I always recall at this point, which is, um, uh, which I, I think worth pondering, but which we won't really ponder ourselves here until uh, we come to Deleuze probably, but uh, in which he says, we must, something like this, we, we must, um, entertain the possibility that ideology itself changes status and therefore form in the various societies that it's in. Uh, we must, for example, entertain the possibility that today that the older functions of ideology in classical capitalism have virtually disappeared and that today the commodity is its own ideology. Now, I think that's a very rich uh, idea which I think has a number of senses. On the one hand, I think Adorno is saying, what keeps society together? What, what keeps this society functioning? Well, in a way, it's no longer beliefs, uh, as it might have been in the 19th century, but rather it's simply the habit of consuming. Uh, if all the members of the society get into the habit of consuming commodities of the post, uh, you know, of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the consumer society type, uh, then whatever they think, uh, that society will be legitimized and will continue to function. And there's a certain that the justification for this would be in the apparent, um, apparent fact that uh, none of these 19th century analyses of, of, um, of ideology seem particularly dangerous today. That is, uh, we're talking about Marx and all these things, and it would seem that those ideas don't really present an immediate threat to, 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 this, to the society. Uh, you, you could see something like this happening. Oh, I, I noticed it in... Um, in the, in the sort of transition of Spain, this is while Franco was still alive, to a, to a kind of new style or consumer style dictatorship. You could sort of talk about a fascism one, fascism two, really, in the, in the Spanish. Uh, there was the, the, the older fascism one in which it was clear that Franco and everybody else thought that ideas were dangerous. And then uh, you couldn't get these books and uh, people were persecuted and so on. When Spain made this transition, suddenly all the books appeared. Everybody could read Marcuse or buy uh, any kind of left text and so on because they had discovered that in that society, uh, ideology functioned in a different way and that it was no longer through the form of ideas that, uh, that things happened, that ideologies either fought, that fought their battles out, either uh, strengthened themselves or were attacked, but rather on some other kind of level, uh, which Adorno is locating in, 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 in the area of consumer con consumption. Now, now this means uh, that the whole 19th century role for ideology, that is, the, the, the 19th century still believed, uh, and clearly this was a meaningful thing, that, uh, that intellectuals, uh, uh, that ideologues had a fundamental role in preserving social order and uh, that, um, they, uh, that, th that it made sense for ideologues to think up whole philosophies of society. Positivism is, of course, the great example of this. That is, a lot of ideologues, uh, university professors, philosophers, and so on, worked at this powerful construction, which is the total philosophy and metaphysic of, of positivism, uh, clearly because it was felt at that point uh, 
that social legitimation, the legitimation, the fun proper functioning of society, required to be capped or crowned with a systematic philosophy. Now, it seems to me that um, uh, that's clearly not the case anymore. That is, the last uh, semi-systematic philosophy that justified our social organization was, was what I guess we call liberalism, not of the 19th century type, but of the new post-New Deal type. And I think, I don't think anybody believes in that anymore exactly, but it hasn't been replaced by anything else because maybe it, we don't need a philosophy anymore. I mean, this, this society now functions in a, in it legitimates itself, doesn't need that kind of uh, legitimation, uh, and it now functions a different way. Well, uh, if that's the case, then of course we have some interesting questions to ask ourselves about literature too then, and how it functions ideologically, and, 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 uh, and in a more general way, uh, we have to be very careful about the, the dialectical nature of this concept of ideology that, uh, that really uh, the function ideology plays in different social formations may be so, uh, so very different, these functions from each other, that uh, we almost seem not to be talking about the same thing at all. Uh, so that uh, certainly religion was a very fundamental ideological uh, f uh, um, uh, form of ideology in, uh, in older societies. Uh, and that is certainly not the place of religion today and so forth. Now, so that means that, that all of the kinds of theories that we're giving and all of these methods for finding ideology in the text, uh, we would really ideally just have to limit them to certain texts, but of course another feature of our cultural world is that we do are already sort of self-limited to certain texts, that is uh, sort of the, 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 the classical canon of the almost, uh, even almost the 19th and 20th century, so that, so that uh, there's a kind of self-correcting thing here. But I think we have to be aware of that, that even if we talk about the ideological component of melodrama, the way melodrama, uh, the various things that melodrama does, uh, which are ideological, that's got nothing to do with medieval literature, it's got nothing to do with the Greeks, it's got nothing to do with Chinese literature or, or, or oral narrative or whatever. That is, we are really always historically based and bound, and, and uh, even though uh, we tend to forget this. Okay, so these are some of the, um, uh, th these, are, this, these are some of the problems which are, uh, which are reached by, uh, by any uh, attempt to, to invent an, uh, a, 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 a a method of ideological analysis for narrative. Now, uh, I said a moment ago I was going to lay out a kind of sliding scale of the forms that ideology can take in a narrative text. Again, this is to be understood in our more limited terms of these books and so forth. But it seems to me uh, this does run a gamut of things from uh, outright ideas. Now, I would call those things uh, opinion, if you like. That is, uh, it seems to me that those are always the most easily identifiable uh, um, uh, forms that ideology takes. And that's why a lot of modern critics don't bother with those things very much uh, because they assume, I suppose on the one hand, they assume that everybody can see for themselves that, that say, John O'Hara is a reactionary or that, or that Balzac is a, is a conservative and you don't need to come along and, and, and tell people these things. Uh, it may not be quite so. Uh, it may not be quite so obvious as that, and, and uh, they also assume, I think, that well, that's old-fashioned. That's old-fashioned literary criticism. That's old-fashioned ideological analysis. The famous uh, analysis of ideological content, and we want something different today, more modern or postmodern or something. And so uh, th those old methods are, are old-fashioned. Uh, I think this remains a very kind of key dilemma for ideological analysis, and we'll come back to it. But. Uh, uh, but uh, there is a sense in which that form of ideology, ideology as sheer opinion, ideology as a set of thoughts or conceptual positions, uh, is one end of the spectrum and somehow the easiest for us to handle. Now, of course, there, there too, um, uh, these ideas may have to be reworked into ideological terms. That is, they may be given us only in terms of philosophy or value. So, uh, so a given work, uh, uh, so, uh, so at that point, uh, the kinds of criticism which say what was, um, oh, you know, what, what, uh, what values are at work in Dickens, what thoughts did he have about things, uh, what were his, you know, the life and work and ideas and so on, what were his, what was his philosophy? That is not yet ideological analysis either. Uh, 
because ideological analysis involves taking the systematic, uh, the systematic form of a philosophy or a system or a worldview or something, and showing that this is both, and remember the terms of our discussion last time, both a mode of false consciousness and a mode of group praxis. Uh, that, it is, that it is a form of mystification, but that it is also a way of doing something and, uh, and a way that a certain social group and generally a class um, tries to work its problems out uh, and fight its battles out in, uh, on the intellectual level. So uh, even when we start from this purely conceptual uh, part of the work, uh, the, the, the philosophy of uh, George Eliot, say, or Dickens, or uh, God knows, you know, the thoughts of Faulkner or something, uh, uh, the thoughts of Wyndham Lewis, uh, uh, even where we have uh, something which is systematized like that, and really in the form of opinion, you know, uh, we still have some work to do to, sh to, to unmask that as ideology and show the relationship of those ideas to their, uh, to their situation. I want to show that in that respect, uh, Nietzsche is a kind of precursor and has some lessons for us, but I'll do that in a minute. Okay, so on one end of the spectrum, we have ideas, uh, sheer opinion, if you like, which may be so systematized and lofty and, 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 and um, how can I say, sublimated as to take on the, the, uh, <coughs> the appearance of a philosophy. It may be so degraded as to be mere uh, ober de dicta and, and, uh, and sort of sounding off. But that's, that would be one level of, uh, one, uh, uh, one extreme of the way in which ideology gets into the work, and I use this kind of crude expression to sort of show that there's a problem about this. Okay, the next one then I think would be um, something in which uh, the, the next sort of deeper level, harder to decipher, would be one in which we find certain fundamental ideological categories at work. And I suppose this is the level at which we find these Gramassian systems at work, too. But first I'm thinking of, uh, I would associate with this, then, uh, the kind of work that Bach did in his most um, political period, that is, the things uh, in uh, mythology, for example, uh, in mythologies, in which, which are a kind of systematic unmasking of the, the pernicious and ideological operation of the category of nature in artifacts which are essentially cultural and sometimes even narrative artifacts. Uh, so this is a level at which uh, the very, um, at which we don't, nature is not anymore exactly a philosophy or an idea, although you could have a philosophy of nature or something, or, or you could be kind of, have a kind of Rousseauian expression of a, some kind of opinion about nature, if you like. But at this level we're talking about, it's not that anymore. It's a question less of idea content, conceptual content, than of conceptual categories. A kind of belief in what Barth calls, trying to foreground this thing and make it distant from us, uh, uh, naturality. Right? That is, uh, the attempt to pass off on people uh, a, a kind of thinking which believes in such a thing as the natural, and thus which can, uh, which can draw on uh, the very powerful conceptual oppositions to this notion of naturality, namely the unnatural. Right? Uh, now we saw that this is also an area, area in which some of Derrida's work uh, was done, and, and uh, at that level Derrida uh, can be seen as a kind of um, uh, ideological uh, analyst and, and, and as, the, uh, as the denouncer and the, uh, of the operation of certain of these categories, which he generalizes out into, uh, I would say, into binary oppositions um, uh, in, in, in general. Uh, if one wants to see these things in a more complicated way, then, as I suggest a moment ago, one can go all the way with the Gaimasian apparatus and see a much more complicated system at work, but we're still in the area of kinds of categories, their oppositions, their organization, and so on. And this is a level of the text which is neither, um, uh, which is uh, maybe uh, not as conscious as that of opinion, but still, I'm using this metaphor of conscious and unconscious, but still relatively uh, surface uh, in the text. And with which the text is not necessarily completely um, uh, uh, in, in complicity. That is to say, uh, there's a whole theory of what art does that of Althusser and Maché, uh, where uh, the very status of the aesthetic and of the work of art uh, 
is described as being a form of unmasking those categories. So for Mashchei, uh, what the specificity of the work of art, as opposed to philosophy or political science or, or something, is that the work of art has as its materials all of these ideological systems and so on, but uh, its very operation as art represents a gradual um, distancing uh, in the Brechtian sense, or foregrounding in the uh, Prague School sense, of these uh, ideological oppositions to the point where suddenly we can see them as ideologies. So here, here the, work, the work of art um, is its own unmasker, so to speak, and the work of art functions really uh, as a form of ideological unmasking rather than merely as a vehicle for of manipulation of, 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 the, of the more standard uh, type. Okay, so we, we proceed from opinion, categories, to uh, yet a deeper level, I think, or at least a level which is operating somewhere else, which is the level that I call the ideology of form, uh, in which uh, something, messages are be being emitted by the formal apparatus itself, namely by the genres or, or, or their relationships or their, their sub-relationships. Uh, uh, that is to say that something is going on uh, in, uh, at, at a level uh, which is neither, which has to do neither with the content of the work, I guess, uh, nor, nor in another sense. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a kind of purely formal level where, uh, where the form is giving out a kind of autonomous message. Now, I, you know, there would be a number of examples one could could give of this, they, they all depend largely on the idea that a work of art is not a single form, but involves a number of formal traditions that are sort of clashing with each other. Uh, and therefore, that these ideological messages are being given by the interrelations of what, I'm, what I call generic discontinuities, that is the way in which, uh, and we saw something like this in Conrad, you see. We saw that we had a, had a proto-existential narrative which was then uh, reworked in terms of a kind of modernistic expressionism, uh, but which had to solve, resolve itself into uh, essentially a popular narrative and adventure story. Well, it seems to me that those, uh, the message of Conrad and the, the ideological functioning of that, of, of, of that very complicated text uh, is at least partly uh, uh, um, uh, being conveyed uh, through the interrelationship of these generic strands and their uh, and their uh, their contradictions with each other, or the way in which one solves the problems of the other, and so on and so forth. Uh, the other example I like to give, and then you'll have to tell me if I think I must have uh, said this here already. The the feasts in Flaubert. Have we talked about that? Uh, did I read you? I think I did this maybe on Friday morning. So, but so it might be worth uh, just. I'm not. I don't have the text here, but there's a. There's a, very, there's a very striking scene, but there's a lot of them in, in, uh, uh, in other works of Flaubert, in, uh, in Herodias, the third of the three tales, um, in which you have all of these various, the citizenry from the whole Roman Empire, you know, is ex all, from all kinds of exotic uh, places, uh, uh, Roman Britain, uh, the, 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 the Goths, uh, Arab tribes, uh, Africans, uh, everything else, are, are all sort of, here at this feast of Herod's, all eating their odd local dishes. So some of them eat, I don't know, dormice, and others uh, others like to, to to pickle things in certain ways, and others drink. To, and so you have this kind of uh, fascination with a with a very uh, very exotic, highly colored multiplicity, uh, kind of clashing multiplicity of of languages, both the, uh, the 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 actual languages spoken, the things eaten, the people in their costumes. Uh, and ultimately, and it, this is really the, the, the point of the religions, because uh, ultimately in Flaubert, uh, these are various forms of belief. Now, um, the way I read a passage like that is that uh, it, this is not only part of Flaubert's reconstruction of the of Roman times. It has a very precise ideological message, but a message which is conveyed, I think, through the form of this thing, rather than through its function in uh, in this story, that is, um, what would be the ideological message of something about the, the, the varieties of cooking in the in, in the in the in, in the in the Roman Empire? I mean, uh, it's clearly not on that level that uh, that this is being conveyed. 
But if you look at other works of Flaubert, if you remember in Sentimental Education, for example, some of the great scenes of the revolutionary, great, one of the great comic scenes of the Revolutionary Club, which in imitation, you know, the comic imitation of the tragedy of the Great Revolution, in imitation of 1789, uh, they spring up a whole set of political clubs. You remember at one point Frédéric thinks he's going to have himself um, uh, elected by that club to be their candidate for, for parliament and so on and so forth. Well, uh, when you emerge in this club, all of a sudden there's, a, there's the same babble of uh, what are not religions anymore, but political uh, beliefs. That is, uh, you have a whole set of the, the, the craziest theories about what's the matter with society and what should be done with it, um, ranging, I guess, I don't know, from paper money, stamp script, all the way to, uh, to whole projects, utopian projects for restructuring the social order and so on. Well, little by little as you hear, and then you have a babble, in fact, a, a kind of babble of languages too, because one, one of, these, one of the, the speakers is a, is a Spanish comrade who's come from Barcelona to expre express his solidarity with the revolution, but he doesn't speak any French. And so his, his discourse punctuates the scene and, and Frédéric can't make himself heard and, and the whole thing ends in a kind of chaos. Well, when you put these things side by side, you see something funny happening. That is, a message is happening which is not in either of those texts, but which is emitted by the form constructed by both of them. You have a notion of babble, chaos, multiple languages. Uh, it seems to me that immediately uh, the message is that modern times are like the decaying Roman Empire. Uh, our uh, period in history uh, is decadence, and therefore this is an early theory of decadence of the type that's going to be developed by a late, little later in the 19th century more explicitly, the whole fin de siècle ideas about what decadence is in that famous book, is it? De de uh, degeneration and decadence and so on, Nordau and so forth. Um, uh, uh, this is not yet an official idea. It hasn't been worked into an ideology yet. It hasn't mounted up to the level of opinion. It's a form. And the form says not only uh, our period is the breakdown, uh, the, 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 the breaking up of the old uh, social unity into a multiplicity and a babel of beliefs and so forth, but it also explicitly identifies those various political opinions with the various religions of ancient times. So it's really a point in which Flaubert, uh, we know from other information about Flaubert, Flaubert believed that what was called socialism in this period, now this means this includes the, the, the commune, but it doesn't really include what we think of as, so that socialism means sort of the social question, anybody who's interested in the poor, what you do with, you know, how you, uh, how you, uh, how you arrange to solve these burning uh, problems of the time. Uh, so socialism are people who want to do, think you can do something about them, want to talk about those things, and, and it's a kind of amorphous doctrine, which would be more, at that point, I suppose, more Proudhon than, than, than Marx. At any rate, uh, Flaubert explicitly assimilates socialism to medieval Christianity. Socialism is religious. So, it, even the reinvention of the commune, he says, that's a medieval idea. Uh, well, here I think the point, and, and then, of course, remembering that Flaubert is profoundly like a good, uh, was he, is he at that point a Third Republic citizen? I don't know, but uh, like, like, like a good 19th century positivist, religion is of course the infam, superstition and so on, so that you, you uh, are entitled then in this very complicated unconscious set of uh, syllogisms, you are entitled to hate socialism because you can train on it the very passions of the bourgeois revolution uh, against superstition, the Catholic Church, uh, uh, religion, and all the rest of it. So, uh, so there's a very complicated set of intellectual processes going on here, which, however, find their immediate expression in this form. So in Flaubert, when you get, you, you, you can get a political message of that type emitted without, uh, without anything else having to be said. All you need is a situation, a feast of some kind, in which there is this, uh, this form, uh, this sort of micro form, is uh, is recapitulated, in which you have a kind of babble of codes of, of, uh, of, of foods and so forth, and that at once, in the very form, emits a complicated message, which has to do with the decay of modern times, the breakup of of older unities, uh, the religious character of socialism, and so on and so forth. So that's yet another level at which. Um, 
uh, at which this uh, ideological uh, uh, investment uh, is taking place. I would say then uh, that level we could talk about as the moment in which form itself becomes a type of symbolic act, which is uh, somehow therefore um, uh, going on independent of, um, of what's happening in, in that form. Uh, and I use the word, uh, when one uses the word symbolic act, of course, you evoke the whole, the heritage of Kenneth Burke, and, and, uh, and I think it's at that point that some, at least some of Kenneth Burke's work is useful. Now, the final stage in this operation of ideology in a narrative text, it seems to me, if you like the deepest, now, do you, if you want to call that unconscious, I don't know. It, it, ha it certainly happens at a non-conscious level is something I don't have a very good term for, but that I'm going to call um, uh, ideological and formal programming. That is, it seems to me that this is what happens when, um, when the very style of a work produces for us a world uh, in, uh, uh, performs a kind of cultural revolution and produces a certain kind of world for us, certain kind of spatial disposition of space in relationship to objects, uh, and programs us to live in that world. Uh, I, I consider that that's one of the great ideological functions of 19th century realism, which was to really have made this, we've said this before, I think, in connection with Flaubert, but again, I think this can bear repeating, that um, the ideological functioning of this style uh, is to produce a new uh, world of daily life, a secular world, which is no longer the space of sacred societies or ancien regime societies, power societies, which is the world of equivalence and the market system, which is the world of decentering. Uh, so Flaubert's text does this not on any level of form production, not on any level of um, uh, of idea or of plot, but on the level of um, of the the sentences themselves and what they do and the way and programs us to this as we learn to read these sentences. Uh, we learn to inhabit this world, and that is the very function of cultural revolution in, 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 in a situation like that. You have people who, are, um, who grew up in the Ancien Régime, who grew up in a society which is still only intermittently a market, market society, a secular society, and you, reading is a way of programming them to secular society. Uh, now, when we get to Lewis, of course, Reading that as a way of programming, programming us to a quite rather different society, it's pretty easy to see that it's a way of programming us to, to the machine, society of the machine, the mechanical, but uh, surely uh, we have to go further than that. We'll try to do that, uh, do that later on. Now, uh, the, the terms in which, one, uh, com in which one explains this program to oneself could vary. It seems to me that the fundamental one for, or at least for our last two centuries of history has to be uh, the terms of Lukács and Weber and so forth uh, that we have already had occasion to look at, namely commodity reification and rationalization. That is, seems to me that that must surely be uh, one of the most basic, uh, uh, one of the most basic uh, places in which, uh, in which these texts program us by the very uh, quality of their reading experience. Uh, and therefore uh, have an ideological function. Now, you understand that this function is at one with the aesthetic. That is, uh, Flaubert, in writing his sentences, uh, is not, at this point, really doing something else. Uh, the very composition of these sentences, the invention of a style, is at that level one in, at, at one with ideological production. But the ideology he's producing now, and that's why this is a funny way of saying it, is no longer a set of ideas. It's no longer a set of values, opinions about the world he's trying to slide across to us, which he's also doing. Uh, but rather, uh, it takes place at a, at a, at a level of, uh, of, of programming itself. Uh, and to the degree that we're programmed, for example, and this lots of people said about the modern world, you know, to the degree that, that we're trained to think in terms of one of the great things that Weber described this in, in uh, already in the Protestant ethic, uh, if you take a pre-capitalist society and you want these people to, to work in the factory, in, a, in an essentially factory or proto-factory system, their whole ideas of time have to be reprogrammed. They can't live cyclical time anymore. They can't live village time. They have to live quantified time. So the imposition of quantified time and the bringing of the watch and the stuff that Thompson talks about in that, in that article of his, 
uh, about time. Uh, these are, but this is, I think we should see this not just as, it's a, it's a new, uh, it's a new function of ideology to produce and to program to produce a new quantified time to rewrite the world in terms of this quantified time and to program people to read the world in terms of that time. That's a whole ideological operation that a lot of people are engaged in. Then you have, then you have these ambiguous uh, reactions to it. What do you do then with the the, the late nineteenth with late nineteenth century that form of late nineteenth century modernism, Bergson? which, which um, attacks quantified time as inauthentic and tries to reproduce for us, reinvent for us some uh, other authentic realm of lived time which would not be that of clock time and, and spatial time. Well, in a sense, Bergson is, a, is Bergson certainly a critique of capitalism in that sense, but one can also ask oneself, and I don't answer it here, uh, uh, one can ask oneself whether by making that kind of separation and suggesting that there's an intimate time which one can reconquer from quantified time, whether you're not somehow perpetuating the very ideology of quantified time. That is, aren't you, in a sense, reinforcing it uh, and strengthening it by, uh, by, uh, by this implicit suggestion that, uh, that yes, the time of the, of the real world is quantified. Uh, so, so there's a way in which Bergson is utopian, that is to say, it's a critique of quantified time, an attempt to, to produce a picture of something else, and there's a way in which Bergson, at one and the same time, is ideological, because he reinforces the ideology of quantified time while seeming to produce another to it. Uh, and this would be true, no doubt, of all the art that, that, that does this, Proust, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so that, at that level, I think there is an operation of ideology that one must describe in purely formal aesthetic terms, uh, and which uh, we and, and which is, uh, I think, uh, which we're uniquely equipped to, uh, to to study, which the social scientists, I think, probably don't focus in quite the same way, and which is gives us the at once a clue to this other matter that we spoke about a while back, namely the whole question of the text of everyday life today. That is, how one, uh, how we today uh, understand the kind of, uh, the, the fabric of uh, our existential experience in, in, in this society, and also understand the relationship of that existential experience to underlying laws, to kind of underlying world system, and, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, now that, that, the, these four kinds of things are maybe a way of organizing some of the, uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, materials we're going we're gonna to deal with in this matter of ideology and, and aesthetics, I guess we can call this, uh, ideological analysis and formal analysis and at least allow us to understand the range of the problems because the, the fundamental problem then becomes the conflict between the people who want to do analysis of ideas and the people who want to do analysis of forms. Uh, and in a way, um, I don't know how it is here. I think in the States, it's clear we're not at that level of sophistication, but certainly in a place like uh, Britain, um, one of the main uh, conflicts in um, or one of the kind of mythic oppositions in Marxism, uh, in the Marxist tradition or traditions, is this, I think, sort of imaginary antithesis between Lukács and uh, Althusser. Uh, the Lukácsians are all those people who are interested in, in realism, and, and thus they're thought to be representatives of old-fashioned kind of content analysis, where the Althusserians are much more sophisticated, or the Telkel people, or the Screen people, and those are people who, who, uh, for whom uh, the real place and function of ideological analysis is at a level that we'd have to call the form, uh, uh, and the, 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 the formal operations of the chain of signifiers or, or whatever. So, uh, so you have an apparent antithesis as though one has to somehow uh, uh, one really has to choose between these two things, and the minute you choose, you're marked, and um, then you're pointed out. I saw a cartoon in the British Radi Radical Philosophy um, Journal, which uh, in which uh, a couple is talking at a table in a restaurant, and the uh, and the man is saying to the woman, uh, pointing to the waiter, he's a Lukácsian. Uh, well, that gives you something of the spirit of this uh, of this uh, conflict, which is which is in in many ways a real conflict, but then in many ways also an ideological one. Now. Um, Terry Eagleton has more recently tried to solve this with his theory of ideology, um, which uh, he does in the following way. This is in his book, Criticism and Ideology. Uh, he says, well, let's, 
if it is so, let's take it at, um, let's separate these levels. And then we say that there's something like an aesthetic ideology in the work. That's the way in which all of the various, the things I've called both ideology of form, programming, and all those things are sort of lumped together, the kind of things that the tel Kel people do, as we'll see in a minute. And then we'll say that there's another level of the work, which is general ideology. Uh, that, that is to say, the ideas. And, and, and so you have a kind of division of labor where if you have a kind of tel Kel, uh, um, uh, uh sensibility, you can go off and work with the formal categories of the work and show that nature or representation or something is at play here, and thus the work is ideological. Thus, Conrad still believes in an ideology of representation, or he undermines it, and that's where, that's the meaning of the aesthetic ideology of Conrad. Then somebody else coming from a, different, uh, uh, from a different angle and a different tradition can come and study the general ideology in Conrad that is what I was doing with ressentiment, for example. How is this a period concept? Uh, where did it come from? What, what role does it play in, um, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in, in social history and so on? And you get two different kinds of, of work because it's clear that uh, the, the, the formal or aesthetic ideology, uh, the people who do that are people who are who are preoccupied with or who, who, uh, who want to invent essentially an imminent way of reading the text. Uh, that is, they want to be able to do something very often very dazzling and, and, uh, and, and, and brilliant by staying within uh, the formal interplay in, in terms of the text, where the other ones are the ones who are sort of related to, to uh, literary historians or historians in general. Those are the people who go and read the boring books of the period or who dig up uh, 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 archives and things. And, and these two bunches of people don't really uh, um, understand each other. That's sort of the extrinsic uh, kind of ideological analysis. And they clearly don't like each other very much or they don't, they, they don't like each other's work, have much respect for each other's work, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think this is a very real conflict in, in this, uh, in, in, which, is, which has its uh, which has its source in, in objective uh, problems. Uh, and I'm not quite sure uh, how uh, one can uh, really solve this. And I think the, one of the ways of starting to solve it is at least beginning to, to recognize that it's there. I think Terry's solution is not satisfactory. That is, uh, what, what his, his solution amounts to amicable separation. That is, you work on this uh, level of aesthetic ideology, and then the rest of you can do general ideology. And, when we meet at Essex, you can give your paper and then I'll give mine and, and so on. I think, uh, uh, so I think that's, that's not how to do it and I'm not sure that I have an answer either, but I think we must first uh, identify this, uh, this conflict, which like all ideological conflicts, and that's something I've also been trying to suggest here in the last few minutes, is a conflict between groups of people with different interests, right? That is the, the so-called old-fashioned analysis of content. Uh, the historians, uh, 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 and in, in, in England, I think that the, the, the Thompson and Williams tradition, uh, and uh, and the other ones are the much more newfangled uh, screen, tell Kel, Althusserian uh, people who are doing something different. And this is so, like all ideologies, what looks like a, a, a conceptual antithesis uh, ends up being a form, I won't call that a form of class conflict at that level, but, but certainly a form of the conflict of groups with their own vested interests, their journals, their own traditions. Uh, if, uh, if the Althusserians are right, then all Raymond Williams' work is, is, is wrong, and so he's, he's somehow de defending his own past, the whole past of a whole group of people, and so on and so on. So these things run very deep, and indeed, uh, I think this example ought to testify to the way in which a real ideological analysis has to be prolonged to the point where uh, it retransforms itself back into a concrete social and historical situation like that in which people are in conflict. Because that was the whole benefit for us of this kind of, uh, of, this kind of analysis. And uh, so I come back again to make a new start to the, the point of ideological, uh, the usefulness of ideological analysis for us. That is, that it's a mediatory concept. It's a concept which allows us to talk about uh, a work formally and also in, in other kinds of ways. And indeed, it's a kind of analysis which forces us to, do, to make these mediations or these transcodings and to move from uh, purely formal or aesthetic uh, analyses of the work back to the point at which the work in situation becomes um, 
a, uh, a, a symbolic expression of groups in conflict. So I think uh, ideally the notion of ideological analysis is a kind of imperative which forces us to, um, uh, to, re, to, to widen the framework uh, in which we're dealing with a work until we reach a point at which genuine social groups appear. Uh, and, and, and appear in conflictual form because after all that's what historical situations are or at least that's what the Marxist uh, view of historical situations are. So it wouldn't be enough, again, uh, this is again why the, 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 the bourgeois sociology of knowledge is not adequate. It wouldn't be enough to widen these, um, this framework to the point where suddenly, finally we found that Shakespeare was the expression of um, the, the, the rising merchant class in London or the this or the that, see? But because that would merely be uh, considering uh, the work, uh, it, would, it would be mediatory to be sure. That is, uh, we have the form and then you have a group, but it would be only a single group and as we said last time, that would be the kind of, uh, a, a mere kind of uh, sociological curiosity that this group thinks in this way, has these values and has this aesthetic expression. No, the, the, the concrete in, in a Marxist view of history is located not at the level of the individual group, but at the level of group conflict, which is to say uh, class struggle. Uh, and it's at that point that you understand not only the values of a group, but the point of those values, the function of those values, which are obviously to legitimate itself against its enemies. Uh, and at that point, then, one is in uh, a concrete view of, uh, of, of history. Uh, the other antithesis in, in, in Marxist approaches has always been, it's not quite the one I mentioned a moment ago, but it is also sort of solved by this conception of, of the contradiction between groups has always been between um, a, so, a sociological deviation and a historical deviation. That is, uh, seems to me, uh, or, or indeed a political deviation, seems to me that uh, the whole development of ideological analysis, uh, here are three rather different ways of uh, stages uh, uh, in which people have, in history, gradually become aware of the operation of ideology and the, the ideological function of culture. I'm not sure what the order of these things are, but it seems to me that there is, that there is a kind of stage in the invention of history in its most concrete way in which uh, various things are discovered. First, I don't know which is first, but let's say uh, initially what's discovered is history as, as, as a succession of events. And that indeed um, works, cultural artifacts, values and so on, are exist in history, and that now you have to invent a new way, a historicist way of understanding values. They're not transhistorical, but they are. Uh, so we have, for example, we talk about well the 50s, culture of the 50s, you know, or culture of the 60s. Now this is already uh, we're we're in the realm of some kind of uh, concrete view of culture when we try to ask ourselves why uh, Catcher in the Rye is so profoundly 50s and why Godard is so profoundly 60s and I don't know today why Pynchon or Tenere are so profoundly 70s, whatever that is, we don't know what it is yet. Uh, we're, we're, we've, we've reached a level in which we've mediated a cultural artifact back into what's essentially a historical sequence, but that's not enough. Then uh, there's a, yet a second thrust in which it's discovered that cultural artifacts are the expression of social groups. And then we get uh, a, uh, a kind of sociology of literature of the type I've described. We, we discover that, yes, certain groups think, different, groups think differently from each other. Uh, and at this point, we can really talk about a, uh, um, uh, and this is this the positive is uh, achieved, I think, already. Uh, we could talk about a whole 18th century spirit, a mode of thinking, which is essentially an expression of this embattled 18th century rationalizing uh, bourgeoisie. So, uh, uh, and, and its products will have a very different spirit from the kind of Rococo aristocratic small court culture that may also coexist in the 18th century. And so there we're in a situation in which we are also regrounding uh, the cultural artifact in some, some uh, more fundamental reality, but it's a different kind of reality than the historical one. Now it's one of social groups. Finally, we can, uh, and the final level of specification uh, is we can, we can understand the political content of the work and then we can suddenly see that uh, a given work play, wants to play a political role, that, uh, that uh, the Marriage of Figaro uh, 
uh, is a political work or some novel of Balzac or, or that even other works that we don't know uh, have a political thrust. That, that the first sentence of Flaubert's um, uh, Three Tales uh, is m doing something political in that uh, uh, local situation of uh, universal suffrage and, and so forth in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, France in the 70s and, uh, and, and, and 80s. Now, the point is that each of these, uh, none of these are satisfactory by themselves uh, because each one of them uh, yields its own brand of, um, uh, uh, it, it has its own built-in limits. That is, it's not enough to see cultural uh, works in terms of pure uh, chronology or historicity. Uh, that's necessary but not sufficient. Nor is it enough to see it in terms of social groups, that's necessary and not sufficient. And indeed, these things tend to be, uh, when you talk in terms of groups, you tend to bracket out history. Or when you talk in terms of historical sequence, you tend to bracket out groups. Uh, nor is the political itself sufficient, because as we've seen, these political situations are very, very local. Uh, so one would have to reintroduce groups back into them and, and chronological history back into them uh, in order to have some. So the Marxist idea of, of the concrete situation is one which manages to put all three of those things together. Uh, and that's why, uh, and that can only be done in terms of, uh, of, of seeing the situation of the work as a determinant contradiction uh, and of seeing it uh, in terms of a group, uh, of, of the struggle of groups in a historical situation which is itself conditioned by a certain mode of production, by its emergence or, uh, or disappearance. Um, so there is an ideal of completeness, or what Lukács will call totality, which one has to hold to, I think, uh, in order to, um, to get an idea of what, uh, of what uh, it means to perform ideological analysis, or what a really adequate, complete ideological analysis ought to be. Now, the problem with this, uh, with, with this word is that, and, and it's a good problem in a way, as you'll see, is that everybody thinks, no matter what you tell them, everybody thinks that when you, uh, when you decide to make an ideological analysis of something, uh, you're attacking it, or you're saying it's bad art. I once, a group of us did a, did a presentation of uh, the ideology of language and of poetic diction in Wallace Stevens. Um, and at the end of this thing, people said, when we, we said this, I mean, we said what I'm saying right now at the beginning of these talks, but it didn't didn't mean it make any difference. At the end, people say, but why do you think Wallace Stevens is a bad poet? Because when you, when you talk about the ideology of, uh, when you talk about Faulkner as being an ideo ideological writer or the ideology of, of language in Wallace Stevens, in spite of everything, even if you say ideology is not a negative, um, is not a negative characteristic, uh, people cannot but uh, uh, take it that way, and they assume that you're simply repudiating the work and that you mean it's bad. Uh, if it's ideological, it's bad. Uh, now, I say that that's a good problem to have because that makes it unavoidable to be in a combat situation with respect to the work. And I think uh, it's essential that, that, one, uh, that one be in that relationship. So it's not, it's not a bad shock for people to, to, to try to have to figure out how one could both like Wallace Stevens' poetry and consider that it is profoundly ideological. Uh, it seems to me when people are able to think of their relationship to, uh, to forms and texts in that way, they've made a discovery about history, you know, and about their position in history, which is very valuable, that we're always in situation in history and that we're always in battle, that, we, that we're always ideologically placed in a lot of different ways with respect to fundamental social groups, uh, and that most of our time uh, is spent trying not to be aware of that uh, and to think that we're in the realm of absolute truth or something or, or our relationship of taste with literary objects is somehow... Uh, uh, eternal or something, and that therefore this kind of shock of trying to combine these apparently contradictory terms of something being ideological and something being, let's say, either great literature or at least something very close to our own feelings and our own taste, uh, uh, it ha has, a, has a really productive kind of function to, to perform for, for people in demystifying their relationship not only to forms but to themselves, to, 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 to groups, to ideologies, and, and all the rest of it. On the other hand, then if that's the way it is, one has to then um, talk oneself uh, 
one has to powerfully uh, react the other direction and keep insisting on uh, the ways in which ideology is not only mystification, not necessarily mystification, uh, but the way in which ideology can also be something else. And this is what I've called the utopian component uh, in ideology. Of ideological analysis of negative hermeneutics that are available to us in the broadest sense. And here, of course, I'm including not just Marx, but also, uh, but also um, Nietzsche, Freud, and all the rest of it. Uh, there are really two versions of ideology which seem to be, uh, which seem to be contradictory with each other. The one is the, the notion, the, the, the conventional notion of ideology is false consciousness, or mystification, or even manipulation, right, as error. And this serves uh, essentially, uh, one would suppose, a form of, uh, one of the functions of legitimation, that is you want, you want people to believe in this, um, this particular erroneous view of the world, namely that, uh, to go back to our other example, that um, crime is a form of, that, that, that policemen are uh, really uh, long-suffering uh, uh, servants of this and that, and that criminals are this and that, and so on. You want people to believe in this myth or mystification about, about your society uh, in order to, to essentially uh, to make sure that um, that they see society the way you do, and thus that they, they behave the way they're supposed to, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a, pres presumably an instrument of control. Now the other way uh, that one uses ideology is quite different from that. Let's say, l let me put it this way. Supposing I said to you, um, uh, could take structuralism, uh, the whole uh, information theory, structuralism, semiotics, is the ideology of a nascent technocratic class. Or take a somewhat more limited level, suppose I said that the new criticism was somehow the ideology of the, the great poetic production of modernism of that period, uh, Hart, Crane, Pound, Eliot, and so on and so forth. Well, at that point, we're using, and, and the word ideology is very generally used in that sense too, right? That is to say, people say, uh, you know, the problem with this group is it hasn't developed an ideology. Uh, it has no, uh, it hasn't worked out its kind of, uh, its own self-consciousness in, and we, we like to call that ideology, and that's odd because a moment ago ideology was a purely negative, uh, 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 kind of pejorative, uh, tool, instrument for, for denouncing some, some, something, and generally a, a form of error or mystification. So in this new, uh, in this new conception of ideology, uh, the whole thing turns around, uh, and um, little by little, ideology comes to be understood as a form of group praxis or group consciousness. Uh, that is, in this, uh, in this view uh, of ideology, Ideology is simply the self-consciousness of a group, and, and uh, to the degree that a group exists, it must have an ideology, and these would range presumably from very, from very small groups to the largest social groups, which are classes or nations or, or whatever. Uh, now, what I want to suggest is that uh, between these two, so I, that ultimately, I would say, is the utopian function of ideology, right? That is because for, for my, from my point of view, uh, utopianism in this Bloch, in Bloch sense, in this now good sense, not the sense of uh, so, uh, utopian socialism that, that, that Marx and Engels denounced, uh, this form of utopianism uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, or utopia is present whenever uh, group existence and collective existence is somehow reaffirmed. So that uh, to little by little, begin to see ideas as an expression of a group praxis would be to, to slowly unveil the ideological dimension of a work. And this, uh, I must say, you see, and I th this is a sort of a scandalous thing, I think at that point then, all ideologies have a utopian component. Because even the most, um, the most uh, exclusive and elite uh, group uh, uh, groups uh, the uh, of, of expressions of let's say small uh, and very uh, and very selective ruling classes, nonetheless, insofar as the, the ideologies of those groups 
express the life of the group and the sense of group cohesion, there is a utopian component. Uh, this is very clear, of course, in fascism, you see, or Nazism, uh, that, that in, a, in a very degraded way. That is, this is this, that was obviously a group ethos and a whole group mystique, and 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 drew, drew on old 19th century ideological uh, utopian traditions, which were, and it was a national socialism. I mean, the, the whole clue to the operation is there. Uh, it is a uh, a use of the utopian components of a certain socialism and a certain kind of uh, and other kinds of group fantasies for. Uh, for uh, purposes of legitimating, well, in that case, uh, if you like, a kind of complicated bunch of classes or maybe even a bunch of thugs. I mean, it depends on how one's reading of, of the Nazi moment. But, uh, but, but I think it's important to, to, understand, uh, 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 to understand that one has to push ideological analysis that far so that one's ideological analysis is not complete unless one manages to identify this group component uh, in it. So I would say that um, a, a genuine, a concrete mode of ideological analysis has, these, has both these tasks and has to perform both of them at once. Uh, and that's very hard to do and I don't know how, um, uh, and, and there is no really foolproof method for it and it has to be reinvented each time, but it seems to me that it can't be complete. That w I've given other specif specifications for completeness, right? I've said uh, it isn't complete until we work the, the, till we reach the point at which we understand the connection between this cultural artifact or this cultural, or this idea, opinion, in the concrete situation of groups and struggle, which is history, which is class, and so on. I've said that it isn't complete until we get a picture of history which is historical now in a narrow sense, sociological and political all at once. Economic too, but that's but in Marxian the Marxian view of economics, that's the organizing category. That's not a narrow, sort of separate thing. Um, now I'm saying that we don't have a complete ideological analysis unless we've understood in what way this work, a given work, is both. And now I'm sort of shifting my terms. I don't know. This is maybe not satisfactory, but is both ideological. That is in the narrow sense of mystification, error, manipulation, and utopian all at once. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so that um, so that henceforth uh, mere denunciation of an ideological component uh, is not enough. We have to somehow feel our way through the inside of the work to the point at which we understand it as if it has any kind of power at all, as also the expression of some repressed uh, kind of utopian thing. And that's the sense in which, I don't know if I said this here last time or if I've said it before, in which I have this kind of rule of thumb that really one ought not, one ought only to make ideological analyses of things for which one has a certain kind of uh, sympathy oneself or a certain kind of affinity. Because then ideological analysis becomes a form of self-analysis where uh, if you denounce that which is absolutely foreign and repugnant to you, uh, it, it may be necessary to denounce it, of course, but it's unlikely you're going to have anything very interesting to say about uh, how it functions because you're not inside of it and you don't, uh, uh, and, and you don't really uh, sense, its, um, uh, sense its spirit. Okay, uh, so much then for this general idea of um, kind of general framework in which uh, it seems to me we haven't said what ideological analysis is, we've just said what it ought to be, uh, what it has to satisfy in order to come into being, and a little bit what its function is, that is, this mediatory function of uh, enlarging the, uh, the, the, the framework in which we see the, the, the work and, and regrounding it in the concrete. Now, I think at this point maybe we have a, another little bit of time. I'll, I'd like to get through this, uh, the, these, um, this Nietzsche essay, which can give us, I think, at least as I read this, a, um, uh, a, an illustration of how, um, uh, how one understands ideas in terms of group praxis. And this is why Nietzsche is one of the reasons, this is one of the ways in which Nietzsche is a good uh, teacher for us and a good predecessor in, uh, in the area of ideological analyses. Uh, uh, there are some ways in which he's not so good, and uh, I don't know that we'll say all those ways, but certainly uh, in a different sense, Nietzsche is a, uh, 
and there are lots of different niches anyway, but I mean, some of those niches are, are ideologues in the bad sense. Uh, but this one has a kind of lesson for us. Now, this little fragment has become the, the, the basic sacred text of, of, uh, of present-day post-structural Nietzscheanism and, and is quoted by everybody, and this is what you read rather than, uh, rather than the birth of tragedy anymore, certainly, or even the genealogy of morals, this little text called On Truth and Lies in the Extra-Moral Sense. Um, it has, of course, a very classical uh, Nietzschean thrust to it. It's a fragment. I think it's even a posthumous fragment. I mean, it's written in the 70s, but it has a was published posthumously, so it's a kind of odd fragment. To, but, but you've also seen, I think, that post-structuralism thrives on fragments and in some way, indeed, may be said to be the ideology of fragments in, in that sense of group practice. That is, this is, the, this is a, in, in one way, a system of people who like to produce fragments and who are explaining to themselves why the fragment is really the privileged mode of expression of our, of our time and so on and so forth. So, so it's, it's very appropriate that this should be a Nietzschean fragment. Nietzsche, who himself was a great fragmentary writer, both of aphorisms and other things, and, and uh, who therefore um, uh, had, a, had a deep practice of this, uh, of this particular form. Uh, this is, um, it's, it's clear what, uh, what an older kind of Nietzsche is doing here. That is, uh, this older Nietzsche is saying, uh, just like the Nietzsche who told us about, um, about ethics, uh, the, that Nietzsche explained to us how um, you believe in ethics, uh, Christian charity, and all those things. Supposing uh, there were a way in which um, uh, these apparently uncontested values of, of the ethical had very, very different meanings than, than any of the ones you've attributed to, to them. That is to say, supposing charity were, were a, an expression of the will to power. Supposing charity, rather than being everything that it says it is on the, on the surface of it, uh, abnegation, uh, service to altruism, service to other people, so on, were in reality a way in which the weak overcomes the strong, in which you uh, make the object of your charity uh, um, uh, uh, dependent on you uh, in, in the form of gratitude and other things, and thus ultimately uh, uh, ch charity, the, the various other ethical emotions or ethical states, become uh, only apparently ethical expressions, uh, and in reality, uh, the expression of a will to, uh, to power and to domination uh, over other people, and a will to ressentiment, or, or an expression of ressentiment, expression of revenge of the weak over the strong, and, and so on. Uh, this is essentially Nietzsche's hermeneutic, Nietzsche's um, uh, Nietzsche's mode of ideological analysis, unmasking these surface thoughts. And, you know, the books he's using are British books, and this is the British 19th century still. This is Victorianism, and I think we don't really grasp the historical Nietzsche properly unless we understand all this as a kind of weird, aberrant, continental uh, version of, of things that ought to have been going on in England itself and in English, uh, and his basic text, of course, that. That, that sprung him out of his dogmatic slumbers was a was a British uh, um, British ethics uh, uh, textbook or, or kind of expression of a kind of, of uh, kind of period feeling about uh, about ethics Victorian ethics and so on. So this is historically really grounded in the primacy of Victorian ethics as an ideology and wants to be an attack on that and in in the process uh, invents a whole new method of. Um, uh, of uh, a whole new type of unconscious and a whole new method for showing uh, what's going on under the surface of apparently uh, anodyne uh, acts. So we have uh, uh, the, the will to power is, the, of course, the Nietzschean unconscious. Uh, and uh, this will to power uh, is then, like the Freudian id or like Marxian class consciousness, is expressing itself in a subterranean way in everything we do, uh, and is trying to disguise itself from, from us because one of the features of it is that we're not supposed to be aware of it uh, and we have to persuade ourselves not to be aware of it or like Sartre's Sartre in Bad Faith, which is a late form of this Nietzschean thing. Uh, uh, and uh, in all these ways is, is, uh, is therefore serving as a new kind of model of what, we keep, what I keep calling the unconscious, that is of, of um, a, a new kind of method for demystifying things, a new kind of model for showing underlying forces, real essential forces of work beneath surface appearances uh, and, and so on and so forth. Now, it's clear that in this essay, we have one version of this. 
uh, that is among the various objects of Nietzschean critique. Uh, ultimately, the main ones are ethical, of course, and beyond good and evil, and so on and so on. But among all of those values, ultimately, we arrive at this other one, which is that is you got, what do you have? Of, uh, uh, you have faith, hope, and charity, but you also have beauty, goodness, and truth. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the objects of, of this critique will come to be truth. Uh, so here Nietzsche is asking us and himself whether uh, that is not to be similarly demystified along with good and evil, charity, and all the rest of it. Uh, supposing, uh, supposing there weren't any objective truth or, or falsehood, but supposing the very binary concept of truth and, and, and truth and lies uh, and the whole moral condemnation of lies and, and the, 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 the automatic and self-justifying feeling that obviously uh, any ethics includes a, 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 um, a stand for truth and a respect for, uh, you know, for um, uh, sincerity and open dealings and honesty and all those things, uh, and that gets generalized all the way up to science. Uh, supposing those things ha had to be jettisoned along with the rest of ethics, and suppose they were themselves the expression of a kind of inner, um, inner will to power of some kind. Well, this, this is why Nietzsche is looking at truth and lies from an extra moral point of view. His is not a moral point of view. He's, he's out of ethics. He's beyond good and evil. He's in the world of the analysis of, uh, of, uh, of, the, 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 of the, the, the search for the will to power in its forms. So supposing this matter of truth and lies, supposing this were also a question of the will to power. What he says is essentially uh, this, that, um, uh, and I think the way we're doing this, we did this with Adorno and Horkheimer, who are quite closely related to this moment of Nietzsche. Uh, and it can be a kind of more general uh, technique for understanding the content of, a, of, of various ideological analyses. We're trying to find somehow the, 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 what, what in the consecrated phrase is the, 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 the ultimately determining instance of a given uh, position like that of Nietzsche's. That is to say, uh, when you've got an idea of error, you must also have an idea of uh, the, the mechanisms whereby that error perpetuates itself and the function that it has. Uh, and when you give that function, you automatically reveal your own metaphysic, if you like, or your own conception of human nature or your own conception of this so-called ultimately determining instance. Now, in Nietzsche's case, it's very easy to see. It's in weakness that we find it. Uh, the whole uh, notion of truth and error comes out of the weakness of human beings face, face with nature. Uh, and therefore, uh, I, that's why I ranged the, uh, the, the, the we, we saw how dialectic of enlightenment uh, had as its basic theory of human nature uh, essentially a notion of uh, weakness in the face of nature and science as a will to power uh, to recover that, uh, to that, uh, recover that, uh, that weakness and that the whole theory of domination contained in, in, uh, um, in, generally in the Frankfurt School, but especially in dialectic human life, came out of that initial metaphysical presupposition about human life. Well, it's the same, essentially, in Nietzsche. He wants to show how, um, uh, how uh, this weak animal, which is the human being, uh, uh, must invent defenses for itself. And one of these defenses is, the, uh, is, uh, is ideas itself, uh, and ultimately uh, the notion that ideas correspond to reality. Uh, uh, and this, uh, this notion is, in a way, itself a kind of defense. That is, uh, Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's point, I guess, is that uh, there is an objective weakness to, to human life uh, that cannot be done away with um, uh, because people die, uh, the, the body is fragile, and all the rest of it. And so um, you have to invent some, uh, a, a whole a whole kind of uh, mirage uh, about uh, uh, which allows us to live with that mortality and to think that maybe we're not mortal or at least that our ideas are, are eternal or, or something. So it's in that sense that, uh, that, this, uh, that ideas as a separate realm of existence are produced and then come to have a kind of autonomy. Um, I can quote, I don't think we have really time to, uh, 
uh, to, to, to look into this part of the essay in that m much detail. But there's a whole notion uh, that, uh, that, that therefore um, one of the fundamental traits of human life is to be, is to deceive yourself about the nature of reality. Right? That's one of the ways in which the weak protect themselves. And this weakness is not uh, merely the class distinction between the strong and the weak within the human race, but rather it's the entire human race at this point, because we've come back to a point which is even before, I guess, the division into strong and, and weak. So uh, people, uh, 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 people uh, wish to sort of begin, enter on a path of constructing a whole series of rationalization, self-deceptions about the world and about themselves and so on, which little by little takes on its autonomy and becomes uh, ideas and becomes the whole notion of truth. Uh, so what Nietzsche is doing, and this is one of the lessons that this text has for us, and Nietzsche in general, he's showing how something that you thought had its own uh, kind of, um, uh, um, its own um, inner logic and meaning, is also a type of conduct. This is Nietzsche's connections, if you like, with pragmatism. Because pragmatism is another form that this discovery takes, of course, in the, in the late 19th century. That ideas are ways of living the world, are ways of doing something to the world. Uh, and that really to, to find out the, 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 the basic, uh, to, to find out the, the, the uh, to, to, to reach an understanding of an idea of the concrete type, uh, we have to suspend the truth claims of the idea and look at it as a type of behavior. Now, it seems to me that this is indeed one of the very fundamental uh, movements or gestures of any ideological analysis. You take something that looked like an idea and you show that it's not an idea, it's a way of doing something to the world. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, one of the great tricks or recipes for ideological analysis is to say, take a philosophical system, oh, as abstract a one as you like, Kant's, Kant's trilogy or something, and, and then you say, okay, the way of analyzing this from an ideological point of view is to ask what happens when people generally recognize this is true. What do they do? Do they challenge, uh, do, do they start doing politics? Do they stop doing politics? Uh, do they behave? Do they, uh, you know, and so forth. So it's by applying some kind of pragmatic, uh, it's by, uh, by re, how can I put it, um, uh, re-articulating a philosophical system, a, a, an apparent idea it's by rewriting it as conduct that suddenly uh, we understand its ideological function. And that clearly Nietzsche is doing in his own fashion, which is not certainly not uh, the Marxist fashion, but, but he's giving us an example of how that's done and, and one of the great and powerful and suggestive examples of how you take an idea and rewrite. These are indeed our two basic categories. In the beginning, we said uh, false consciousness, group praxis. The false consciousness would be the judging of false culture would be looking at the idea as a representation of the world. Is it true? Is it false? Is it faulty? What is it? Group consciousness one gets to when one looks at it as a form of behavior. Uh, what, is, what is this idea or philosophical system as a form of behavior? What does it do? And ultimately, what does it perpetuate? Who does it help? Who does it hinder? And so forth. And one must say these things very crudely because I think uh, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, um, ways of defamiliarizing, undermining some of the um, age-old kinds of uh, crystallized pretensions of philosophy and thought in, in general and culture in general which have come down to us. And thus they must be undermined in what are relatively vulgar ways sometimes. Now uh, this then is one of the examples that this uh, one of the things that this text does for us, but it wasn't my main reason for, for touching on it, because in that sense, Nietzsche is also the philosopher, is also a post-structural philosopher of, um, of uh, a rhetorician and a philo philologist, and a, the first great philosopher of the symbolic. The first philosopher who said uh, there is no, uh, the, 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 not only that there is no real uh, uh, um, uh, objective truth to be, to be, to be said or to be, concocted about the external world, but indeed that we live in language uh, and, that, uh, uh, and that we live in, in what's essentially what people would t t today say, call a kind of rhetorical universe, a universe of tropes. Uh, 
uh, in which there is no literal language. That is to say, there is no place in which there can be an objective representation of the outside world, but only a whole series of various representations organized around, um, around tropes. Here's the key passage, and I read it to you um, as my friend Gayatri Spivak quotes it in her introduction to um, the grammatology. It's been quoted in a lot of places. So what is, tr what is truth then? I'm sorry, I'm again translating this simultaneously. A moving uh, troop of metaphors, metonymies, anth uh, anth uh, and anthropomorphisms, which uh, heightened poetically and rhetorically, uh, are translated and adorned uh, and, and ultimately uh, come to feel uh, canonical and binding uh, after a long, after long tradition and habit uh, in, a, in, in a given uh, a population or a given people. Uh, truths are illusions, this is the famous sentence, truths are illusions about which you've forgotten that they, are, uh, that they are illusions. Metaphors which have been used up and become powerless for the senses, uh, coins which have lost their, uh, their, 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 their graven picture, and now only as metal and not as coins, uh, and now come before us only as metal and, and not as coins. Uh, now, this is a very powerful uh, expression of the, 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 um, the situation I just, uh, uh, um, uh, I just described to you, and it, and, it, and, it, and it brings in, I think, a new uh, possible um, description of ideological uh, formation. Uh, it's one which will be worked out much more fully, I think, in, in Husserl in the, in the crisis, the idea that... Um, ideology functions as a, um, or that we are to study things as acts uh, which have only left traces behind them. As Husserl's term, I think, is sedimentation. That is, as the traces of acts which have been forgotten or repressed through for forgetfulness. Husserl's um, analysis of geometry, another classic fragmentary uh, privileged text for the, for the structuralist Derrida has, all of Derrida comes out of it in a way, uh, out of his commentary on it. Husserl's uh, uh, origins of geometry show that geometry began as a form of praxis, measuring and so on, then uh, was hypostasized into a set of formal propositions. We forget about the act of geometrical measurement, land surveying, we have only the operations. Then, little by little, these get used in scientific, uh, these get built on by later science in a forgetfulness of origins. And for Husserl, then, that forgetfulness or repression of origins, that forgetfulness or repression of the relationship between what's become apparently pure form, pure mathematical play, and ultimate praxis or action, uh, is the source of everything well, for Husserl in the crisis, everything that's going wrong with Western civilization, that is, it's our, uh, the disembodied character of science, it's also its consciencelessness and all the rest of it, uh, it are ultimately to be attributed to this uh, distance from, from, from its origins, from its origins in praxis, in action. Well, this is going on in Nietzsche. I mean, he's saying that ideas uh, can originally be un understood as forms of praxis, uh, but later, later on we lose our connections to that, we forget about that, and so we are deceived by them, because we because we repressed uh, that that, uh, that relationship to praxis now, uh, uh, and that the tropes are themselves forms of a certain praxis. Now the part that was left out is this. I'll reread this section. What then is truth? A moving troop of metaphors met and metonymies and anthropomorphisms, and now I fill in the the points you suppose you know. In short, a sum of human relations which uh, heightened poetically and rhetorically uh, and so on and so forth are translated and adorned and then, and then come to be thought of as truths by uh, people in whom these things have been drilled in by, by long, by long uh, 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 tradition and habit. Well, look, at if, if, if the tropes are sedimented human relations, then everything changes. Then this Nietzsche can't be appealed to as a post-structural Nietzsche, but you have almost a proto- Marxist Nietzsche here, who's talking about the way in which praxis uh, 
leaves its traces in, uh, in language and then the, we forget about that praxis and it disappears and, and we have, we're just left with the language and the forms and so on. And, uh, uh, and we must see all this in a very different, uh, different perspective. Now, it's true, this is a perspective that Nietzsche himself does not often uh, explore and later on in this, uh, in, this, um, in this essay at once draws back from this and is interested only in understanding these truths or science as uh, so many, he calls it, uh, it's like the, um, uh, he says it's like the, the, the way in which bees uh, build their, um, what, are the, what do bees live in? Their hives, yeah, that uh, this, whole, this whole structure of science is a kind of uh, secreted, almost instinctual thing that human beings have, have built up without, without being aware of it. Uh, and then, then it carries on its existence in the void, and then we believe in this illusion of, of science as some, some, somehow absolute. But I think uh, equally interesting for us is this other uh, movement in Nietzsche, which is the movement of regrounding these things in, uh, in, in some form of praxis, and, and, and one which is, uh, which is only followed when in, for that form of praxis, uh, which is dominant in Nietzsche's, uh, in Nietzsche's uh, exploration of these things, namely, uh, the struggle of the weak and the, and the strong, and the whole and the whole will to power and, and ressentiment, and so forth. Okay, I think that's probably uh, all we have time for today. I will then next time. Hopefully, we'll get to Deleuze in our two last sessions. I will next time want to go on with this, insofar as it uh, uh, with ideological analysis, with particular reference to the Telkel kind of stuff and to uh, to. Lacanian psychoanalysis, which is, of course, the dominant influence in, 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 this, uh, in these, uh, in these things.